In this week's episode, we look again at what's going on with Rhythm and Hughes. We have a fascinating Pick My Brain question and special guest, Olivier Pollet. Girl and a Gun, recorded 4th of April 2013, episode 2, Fishy Business. All you need to make a is a girl. Hello and welcome to this episode of A Girl and a Gun, the show for filmmakers and content creators. I'm Phil Moore and as always I'm joined by John Mazels. Hello everybody. Um, I, just pull that up, pull up John's shot again there for me if you could guys. Media versatilist. No, media versatilist. Now I, even I can't say. <laughs> what is it? Media versatilist. But what's a media versatilist? Well, media. You probably know what the media is. Don't tell me you don't know what the media is. I know is. what media is. Media what's a versatilist? Is. Okay, versatilist is a, this is a term that's been around since, ooh, I don't know, the 1970s, 90s? 1970, 90s. 1970s, <laughs> 90s. And uh, it was, it's coined by Gartner Group, so it's very official. Oh, okay. Okay, and it means somebody who's both broad and deep in broad. skill. So in your skill. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, 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 uh. Your, your skills are broad and deep. They are. Uh, I guess I'm a media versatilist as well, then. Excellent. And we'll be watching you tonight on Versatellite. Right, Versatellite. Okay. Um, uh, we're going to open, as usual, with the news of the week. <laughs> and it seems the past several weeks there's always a running story... What are you laughing at? I'm laughing at you putting on your glasses going, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that was going to happen. It's like, hello, we're on television. <laughs> on television. Who would have thought? Um, Rhythm and Hughes. Yes. Visual effects, uh, this has been going on for several weeks now. Last I week think it's going to be going on for a while. And it's, yeah, as well. it's not quite over yet. No. Last week we reported that Rhythm and Hughes were up for auction and there was a, one company in particular that looked like the front runner. Well, that auction has happened. It lasted for several days. And that front runner did not end up winning. In fact, one of the uh, the dark horses of the race, Prana Studios, which is based where? Which is well, uh, holding company connected to Prana has agreed in blah blah blah. Where are they based? They, uh, offices in LA and India. So yet another Indian American company. Goodness gracious me! <laughs> uh, and they've got credits including Hoodwinked uh, and Planes, which is animations with Disney, that kind of stuff. So they. I won't give you the full details because it was a bit of a saga, mm. the auction process here. But Prana were in the running, then they pulled out, and then um, uh, the other companies that were... Uh, uh, there was two other companies uh, who were in the running, the one we mentioned last week. I'm trying to find them here. I can't find their names now all of a sudden. Uh, but Prana ended up coming back into the race, and the other companies that were front runners, they didn't do the due diligence or they wouldn't... It, declare their finances properly so they sort of said well you're so, out of the so running. So has it said how much Prana have paid for Rhythm Yes, Hughes? so there's a, a, about two million dollars uh, in cash but million. they also accept taking on debt. Two million or two billion? Million. Million. But Is that all? all? But they're taking on also debt and they're also there's promises to employees back pay and so it adds up to about 17 million dollars total. For, for 17 million dollars Phil you and I could have gone and taken on the debt and yeah, made a whole lot of promises. Yeah it doesn't seem like a lot. No it doesn't not no. for something as big as Rhythm and Hughes. This is really interesting so now that they're owned by an Indian company does this mean we're going to see special effects where halfway through the effect everybody suddenly bursts into song for no apparent reason Everything. does a big dance sequence well, and then goes back to this relates to a later story involved. in fact which I'll get to but uh, it's not India, in fact, the country, the country that's uh, taking over Hollywood. It's someone else. Oh. Uh, but ri further on this, though, Rhythm and Hughes, uh, the owners of Rhythm and Hughes were not really part of this, and there's still some question about whether it's a valid bid and they actually are buying it. So next week there may be even more news on this. We don't know. So it could, it could still fall through. It could still fall through. Mm. Uh, the owners of the company, uh, John Hughes and Pauline So and VP of Software, Keith Goldberg, uh, they have not been, they have been promised employment rather mm. in the new Rhythm and Hughes. Uh, but the bid is not without controversy, as they say here. So, so we, we learn something from this, which is that there is somebody named Hughes, but there's nobody named Rhythm. <laughs> yes, quite possibly. Uh, further on this visual effects uh, fiasco that's going on in Hollywood, there's an interesting article here from Creative Cow, uh, the website Creative Cow, they do a magazine. Uh, on Creative Care magazine, there's uh, a part two written by Deborah Kaufman on can the VFX business be saved? And she actually goes into some length of there used to be a union 
for members of this. Back in the early special effects days, mm. before it became full on computer visual effects, uh, there was a union for these guys because they came out of cinematography and doing model work and that kind of stuff initially. And there was also um, a visual effects society. So they've had the society and the union kind of already, but that's all been lost in, in the marches of time somehow. Uh, and as we discussed last week, there's talk about trying to get these things back up and running, uh, like an effects society. I, I'm still not yeah. sure how a union is going to make any difference to a company's viability in this environment. And I might be sticking my neck out something horrible there, but I I don't see the point. I can see I can see places for unions. I just don't see how this is going to make a difference. Well, one of the arguments is you need, there's three pillars to this tripod: a union, a trade society. Um, a trade association, rather, for the uh, employees uh, and f for the practitioners so that they, they can yeah. uh, promote the betterment of the skills. And obviously visual effects skills are very good mm. at the moment, so that's not a problem. Um, and a trade association for the employers. So, you know, a society, um, an employer society and a union for the workers themselves. I still don't see that's going to end up with anybody being more solvent. The real problem is work and, and maybe mismanagement or maybe creative well, management. Well, there's or something work else. in India, by the sound of it. Yes. <laughs> India. And other places. And other places, and other, which I'll get to in a moment, in fact. Mm. But the you first keep saying that. I do. And I I'm will waiting for it. But there's another story we talked about last week. It's actually with my pick, my pick Your Brain question, which is about uh, video editing software. Mm. And I talked about um, Final Cut Pro 7 and, and we Final were all Cut saying, Pro 10. saying how they'd lost the plot. Apple lost the plot. Everyone's jumping ship on Final Cut Pro 10. Most professional editors do not use it, and they've abandoned Final Cut Pro. Well, as it happens, this very week, this very day, in fact, in, in America... In response to what we said, no doubt. In response to what we said. They Which were hasn't listening. even been seen by anybody. Even though, as we speak, our first episode hasn't gone online yet. <laughs> so there's but a Apple, secret camera in this studio going direct to Apple executives. Direct to Apple. They, they've heard okay. through the rumour mill. Watch out. Uh, but because... Coincidentally, NAB is happening starting in a couple of days. Um, today, in American time, which is like late tonight, Australian time, um, Apple are promoting Final Cut Pro 10. There is a new version just released this week, a new minor update, and they're actually doing a big push now at NAB to promote the software to professionals if, again. If you were going to do a, a big release like that, you would do it at anybody. Uh, you'd do it at NAB, but uh, everybody knows, everybody in the industry knows, that anybody who is releasing a product at NAB doesn't have the product quite ready. Mm. It's like it's it's just absolutely tragic that uh, stuff goes to NAB. It's like just flimsy enough not to fall over during the demo, and you really got to wait another six months for it to be right. The but it's, it's happens, good it, news though. It's yeah, good news that, that happens at something. game shows and all sorts of things when yeah. they they're pre-releasing that. And, and I've worked on a game. We tried to do that. Get something specially ready for the, this game show. And it's like we're nowhere near finished the game yet. What are we doing? <laughs> uh, but they've got, uh, they've got examples here. There will be a new version, um, 10.1, soon, later this year. But basically, Apple is saying, we haven't given up on your professional editors. Please have another look at our software. It's been nearly two years since the initial release. Have another look. Stuff you've missed is probably in there. And it is a good piece of software. I mm. said this last week. It's just that it wasn't what people wanted. It wasn't the update people the expected. Version, no, just dumbed down. Um, and if you're in that middle range, and they, they cite a few people that are using it, and you know, as always, the, the company will find an editor in broadcast television that's using the software and saying how wonderful it is. Who knows? Maybe they'll bounce back. Mm. I don't know. They've lost a lot of people to Avid and Premier. Uh, whether they'll come back, I don't know. Mm. Uh, anyway, Apple are trying to do it. So onto the story I was referring to earlier. The other country that is starting to dominate Hollywood is China. <gasps> Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Uh, it, if you remember the film Looper from mm. last year, there was a sequence in that, the Bruce Willis time travel film. There was a sequence in that uh, set in Shanghai, and that's in the film. And there was another sequence set in, uh, set in Paris. Now, for the Chinese release of that film, they transposed that Paris sequence back into Shanghai. So they had a bigger Shanghai sequence in the Chinese version of the film. Paris got Shanghai. Paris got Shanghai. Mm. So in China, they saw that sequence set in Shanghai, which meant more of the Chinese actress that was in that uh, and more of China as a city. OK, so uh, who would have thought that a film would be recut for domestic consumption? Well, who, well the There's people who don't... There's a concept. Iron Man 3 is now doing the same thing. They have a partnership with a Chinese company and a good part of the film is going to be set in China. 
so it has a better chance in the domestic market in China. It's a big market now, obviously. I, I, I wonder what the appeal is for that sort of show. I mean, is that is that the typical archetypally Western cartoon look of an, an Iron Man property? Does that have universal appeal? The first two films must have done well there. And uh, it's a big, uh, you know, this is a big, massive blockbuster film, the Iron Man franchise. But they're producing it there. But they, you, they, I can understand yeah. that. You're saying that they're going to but in terms of release people watching it, for, it for local consumption. Yeah. And, and they'll put an Amer- a Chinese star in there. They've got a top Chinese actress, uh, Fan Bingbing, mm. is going to be in the film. Uh, and they'll offer specially prepared footage made exclusively for these Chinese audiences. So we will not see this unless you get the Chinese special edition. It's like a mo- watching a movie in Korea, you know, it's a totally different ending. They're not the only ones, though. Uh, the new Transformers 4 is mm. going to do the same thing. They're going to China, they're starring a Chinese actor, it's a co-production, and they're going to shoot stuff especially for the Chinese market as part of Transformers 4 as well. Well, that, that's, Stuff that we will not see. That, <laughs> well, <laughs> Unless you I can the tell you about the whole of Transformer 4. Transformers well, it's 4, true, I probably will not see any of it. No, I, I, I mean, like, Rise of Galvatron. You know, does John want to go to see a movie called Rise oh, of Galvatron? Is that what it's going to be Notwithstanding called? the fact that it's going to be voiced by Hugo Weaving. It's all a bit naff for me. But, you know, Michael Bay has a definite style. And it's got Fan Bing Bing again. She's really? going to be in both of these by the look of it. My God. By one of the country's biggest actors. Uh, Galvatron and Fan Bing Bing. I haven't Bing seen Bing. Fan Bing Bing in anything. No, I haven't yet either. No. Uh, anyway, there's two Although of Although if, if it's Bing... a Michael Bay movie, you'd want to be seeing her out of everything. Probably. Okay. And so I'm assuming she's that kind of star. Yeah. Uh, so Hollywood taking over China. China's taking over Hollywood. They're going for the market. On to other business. Uh, this week, Game of Thrones, the new third season of Game of Thrones was launched. Do you watch it? I've, I've seen a couple of episodes of Game of Thrones. It's, you know, again, it's not the sort of thing that I would personally do. I think it's great. Uh, Game of Thrones has single-handedly recreated employment opportunities for uh, little people, which is He's excellent. a great actor. He's a very good, he's a good actor. actor. He's, he's you know, great. So... He's great. And I've sat in that chair... In fact, I sat in the chair before I realised I knew what Game of Thrones was all about. Mm. I didn't die, so... You sat in the throne? The throne. When was that? Oh, it was uh, uh, two years ago at the World Science Fiction Convention. Oh, okay. Where, you know, you go through those things. This was after I'd just uh, had the uh, cup of coffee with George R.R. R. Martin. Oh, oh did yeah. you really? Yeah. Okay. So have you read the books? No. No? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm Peter, certainly not telling him that. Peter Dinklage is, 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 is the, the, one of the stars of Game of Thrones, uh, which the third season started with a big, big launch this week. And I'm, I'm a big fan of it. I've watched the first two seasons twice through now, getting ready for the third. We've got a story here, again from Creative Cow magazine, uh, a really nice behind-the-scenes uh, conversation with Annette Halmick, Mm, I think I'm saying it right. Lovely name. Annette Halmick, um, who was one of the cinematographers for a couple of the episodes, episodes four and five, which are coming up in a few weeks' time. And she talks about the process and how they worked and all of that. Uh, really interesting article. Again, one for the cinematographers out there. But still on Game of Thrones, uh, it was such a huge... This first episode of season three was such a huge success. In Australia, we get it only on Foxtel currently. So if you're subscribed to Showcase Showtime, you'll get it. Mm. Otherwise, you can't see it. It's massively pirated as a result. And we saw it here on the Monday night, it was Sunday in America and Sunday in the UK, so it's pretty much same-day release around the world to avoid the piracy issue. Nevertheless, this is the most pirated TV show history, in history now, mm. uh, since an early episode of Heroes. How on earth do they, me- do they measure that? They look at the torrents. They literally look at the torrent streams and how many people are seeding it, and you can see. Mate, you'd have to wonder, if they can look at the torrents, why can't they stop the torrents? Uh, That's tricky, and that becomes a whole other issue. But the makers of the show, they had a director of the show uh, here in Australia a few months ago, and he sort of inadvertently said, well, that's a compliment, actually. It sort of shows that we're a very popular show. And he got blasted a bit for sort of of saying, piracy is not that bad, It's it's a good sign. (laughs) <laughs> and you've got the makers here, they're being very diplomatic, but they're also saying the previous record here, it says, was Heroes, which had 144,000 plus. Um, there was 160,000 simultaneous peers sharing just one file of this episode, and there were no doubt various versions of it out on there. Um, some of the makers, the producers of the show have said, it's funny because there is a little part of you that goes, yeah, we're the most pirated show. You th- then you think, oh, that's really bad, isn't it? <laughs> 
Look, it's piracy popular. Is, piracy is not what the industry is looking forward to. Uh, true, but it doesn't seem to be hurting uh, viewers or sales figures for the show. And there's a big d debate here about how much does piracy actually affect sales of movies, of DVD, and that you can go one way or the other, you know. Anyway, Game of Thrones, the most pirated show in history currently, thanks to the last episode. Mm. Okay, we've got a couple of videos that I'd like to finish up with here. There's one here from, um, uh, from I got from Studio Daily. Uh, it's a hacked, they hacked the DSLR camera mm. and the shutter on this, and they filmed these parkour people. And just have a look here what they've done. Just run the video there if you could. Here we are at the Tempest Free Running Academy. This is the intervalometer device we have, and um, we've got you two of them today. this, right? I'm not gonna mess up my camera. Yeah, no, it's fine. Okay, this goes oh, oh, no, I, I talked to Paul about shooting you guys. Uh, he, he didn't talk to you? Yeah. Is he in the back, or? Uh, yeah, he's, he's back here. Oh. Do you think it's gonna work? A couple of them worked. One of the ones was really glitchy, so hopefully it'll, uh, it'll work this time. Uh, hey, yeah, out. yeah. Um, so, yeah, thanks for helping me out. Got, uh, there's Lucy. Oh, hey, hey, so you can uh, see they so basically little attachment on top of the camera and they've got a sound recorder there. Whenever you press on it with your hand, when you squeeze in the air, Every time they squeeze that thing, it takes a photo. It, whenever you press on it something, it presses the shutter of the camera. It'll all right. This one's been really and when they're active, really they're really doing sure. this a lot. If it stays on, it's squeezing their palms. Time, so we'll see. Uh, do you, you want to be over there? And I'll just, I'll be over here. We'll get it doesn't work if you've got hairy palms though, does it? And this is what they end up when you put these photos together as a sequence. Okay. Alright, Paul. <laughs> Whoa! Cool. <laughs> uh, oh, that's right, so there, have a look at that. We can stop that one there, but you can look at the rest of that. That's on uh, Studio Daily, and it'll be in our show notes. The one I'd like to finish with, though, um, there's also, uh, if you're familiar with visual effects, uh, motion capture especially for animations, uh, it is very big. If you saw the Lord of the Rings films and how they did Gollum, mm. uh, they had Andy Serkis literally jumping about in a river, freezing his ass off in a, in a suit, and then they had to rotoscope him out and get the 3D animation to match his movements. Mm. But at least the water was splashing, mm. for real. Um, they've now, these guys have developed a much more affordable ver ver version of motion capture, where you don't have to have the little balls all over you, you don't have to have as many cameras around the room capturing your movements. Uh, they've got here, it says, uh, it's, I think it's 5 to 12 ordinary cameras, HD cameras, which is cheap these days. Mm. Uh, and they make it easier to set up and more affordable for projects. And you don't have to have, you can wear normal clothes practically, and it finds where your body parts are. So That's a very scary thought. If you scroll down a bit, you'll find a video. Let's run the video on that page there. Just scroll down a little bit and you'll find a video that shows us exactly there are this new motion capture in action. So you can see there that the uh, the red guy versus the blue guy there, and it, it's, it's just following their movements. The, the guy on naturally. the left appears to have no balls at all. No, nope, well, okay, <laughs> no balls at all. <laughs> so yeah, just the, look, look at that lame. That fight skeleton that is, there yeah. is being imposed by the the cameras and the computer graphics involved. Uh, it's just following their movement. It's naturally seeing where the arms are. Mm. Uh, and you could, this means that this system could, it doesn't have to be bound in the studio, you could take it out on the road, out on location, and follow people uh, doing this kind of stuff. Uh, potentially a really good idea, and it's, again, motion capture is coming down to the common man, it's going to be very affordable. To everybody, set this up. everybody will be doing this in a moment with their, you know, the, everybody who can afford a 5D mm. will be doing this, turning this out. Well, you still need five it, or so cameras around. And integrating it, but, with a whole yeah. lot of GoPros and going, man, I'm turning out movie quality high def video. Yeah. Bunch of GoPros around to get the various angles, throw it into that software, right. and you've got motion capture that you can then apply to animation or CG or to put into film. No balls. Brilliant stuff. That's the end of the news for this week, and uh, we actually have, last week we started a series of uh, tutorials with Paul Howard on cinematography. We have episode two for you right now. <laughs> Hello and welcome to part two of our cinematography series. Here again with Paul Howard. How are Paul? Hi Phil. Uh, today we're going to look at how to set up a tripod. Yep. Let's do it. Very basic, but it's very important, I'd say. 
So we have a Miller Compass 25 here, which is a 100 mil bowl, which is, which is this area through here. Uh, relatively lightweight. Um, and by lightweight, I mean uh, for lighter weight cameras. You wouldn't put a big uh, cinema camera on this. It's, it's not quite sturdy enough. But this is, these, are, these are awesome cameras. Um, uh, beg your pardon, uh, tripods. These are awesome tripods. <laughs> just, just go through the different parts of it if you could. Okay, so this, this whole part from here to here is the head. Pan handle, uh, lock, drag, counterbalance, which I'll go through in a sec. These are the legs all the way to the floor. These are two stage, these are two stage legs and they've got two, two clips here. You can undo the bottom ones. Okay. And, and you can get it up to its full height. Right. It's also got a, a, a mid spreader which you can lock and that stops the, the, uh, that stops the legs from splaying out. You can also undo them here which is better for when you've got the camera all the way down uh, to the, the bottom of, of, the, of the tripod travel you undo those and it'll spread right out so it'll get the camera as low as, low as, as you can. possible. Yeah. Yeah. Which, is, which is what that's for. Um, so you can, if you're in a tighter space, you can pull this up and you can tighten that all the way up and then that again stops them from splaying out. Uh, so this part here is the bowl and this is the nut. You can undo that so that you can re-level the head. And any decent tripod has a little level in there. What's that for? Uh, well, so that you can level the head part. Uh, often you, your legs might be a bit like that, you know, if, you've, if you're on an even ground and uh, that way you can re-level the head. Uh, by using the level. One of the things that I like about the Little Millers is that they have the little light here. It lights up, um, you know, the, the pan and tilt and also, and more importantly, your bubble. Because then when it's dark and your bubbles, you can't oh, see so the bubble. Oh, so you actually see the controls yeah, here. Yeah, because if you look, down, so you look down in there and you can see the bubble lit up. Right. What now, do you mean by the drag? What's okay, that? so the drag, you want, a, you want a little bit of tension on your head, sometimes, depending on the application, depending on what you're shooting you might want a bit of drag. In other words, if you, you've got the dials here, and they, on this particular model they go from one through to five, on both the pan and the tilt. Now, when you engage it, you can engage it up to, say, three. It'll be a lot harder to It adds more to tension to it. It adds much more right. tension to it. Uh, you want to sometimes match those so that you've got as much pan and tilt drag tension. Uh, so are there situations directions. where you want that higher and lower? Yeah, for instance, some people, there's a, you know, a, a look that some people have which is called loose head, where you, know, you just want the camera kind of just wandering a little bit. You might, if you want to, you could wind all the tensions off completely, and then there would be, it would just wander around. You could just wander around. Or if it's very windy, you might want to wind it all up to five, or if you're following horses or cars or something, and you're on a very long lens, then you might want to, you know, have much more drag or tension. Right, so depending on the shot and how much you're panning and tilting, that's right. whatever feels right for what you're trying to get. Yeah, that's right. Yeah? That's right. Uh, so on the, on, the, uh, on the plate here, uh, you've got a, um, the ability to balance, which is very important, depending on where your camera's uh, so to, that's point On the is. camera, you, if it's got a big lens or something, it's, so it's front heavy, you, might you push that back. back. Actually, right. yeah. um, the other thing, it's got this particular model, a lot of them have, but this particular model's got a one to five, uh, a one to four counterbalance. So when there's no, uh, there's no tension, you've got the tensions wound to zero, um, there's, and there's no counterbalance on it. <coughs> the counterbalance allows the camera to come back to centre, right. and that way it'll stop the camera from overbalancing. If you have it too stiff and you don't have enough tension, it's a very lightweight camera, you're going to push against it, which you don't want, so you can just wind the counterbalance off. But very important to stop your camera from crashing. So um, in terms of, the, there's lots of different tripods. We're looking at a particular Miller model at the moment, yep. which is an Australian brand. Yep. Uh, there's many brands, many sizes and types. So where does this fit into the larger range of tripods available? Oh, this is good for, you know, maybe mid-sized cameras. Uh, you know, something like be awesome for a Scarlett or for an F3 or, you know, they're, they're great. Uh, it's great. It's got a 100mm bowl, which fits a lot of things. You get them in 150mm bowls. Um, in, in many different um, variations. So basically, the bigger the tripod, the sturdier, the bigger the weight it can carry, the, the bigger the camera generally, yeah? Yeah, heavier. yeah. When it's a really heavyweight camera, you want a big head underneath it uh, to allow you to do you know, as smooth a move as possible. There are other, uh, um, other heads that have wheels here, and they're called geared heads. Mm. And again, that's for a very heavyweight camera 
that you'd put on that for a lot of the smaller uh, cameras these days. This kind of thing's pretty good. And you also have other st styles of legs. You can have single stage, you can have a third stage, you can have telescope ones. Um, they're they're normally for much smaller cameras though, yeah? Yeah, they do, they, yeah, yeah. You can put, you know, you can put some reasonable weight on them, but uh, different, depends on what you're doing. And it also depends on your personal preference. If you've used one for a while, you might want to stick with that. Most tripods have little feet on them, which, you know, as you're showing there, allow the, um, the foot to come off and that way you can just use the spikes. The spikes are also good for grass or um, places where you want the, the tripod to dig in. Mm -hmm. That's what they're for. The on pads, the beach with the sand. <laughs> yeah, maybe the pads <laughs> tend to be for harder surfaces because the spikes won't work on the harder surfaces. So you'll have a removable pad like that. And they're also good for locking into things like wally dollies, other doorway dollies, where again you take the feet off and it'll, the, the, the spikes will lock into you know, to the, the bottom of the dolly and, and hold the stuff. Off. I often like to get this arm and like put it under here. You know, it would be... Uh, driving with the breast. Driving with that and so yeah, you control it more like that. So you've got both hands free. Cool. And, you know, and that's why I'd have this looser. Uh, I often find that's a good way to control the tripod. I've never it's seen anybody do that, but it's <laughs> good. So I love about it. It's what I love about operating. Operating's a, an awesome thing to do and uh, when you have a really lovely pan and tilt head, you're going to have a great day no matter how you use it. Mm. Thank you very much, Paul. You're welcome. And welcome back. And today uh, we have a very special guest with us in our second episode, our first ever in-studio guest, Olivier Pollet. Thank you. Did I say it right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, good. That's good. Um, uh, you've, you've made a documentary film, Canning Paradise. Yep. And you've, uh, the film uh, has got into a few film festivals and has won a couple of awards and things. Tell us, before we get into the film itself and the, and the awards, um, what got, tell us what the film's about first. Well, the film is about Papua New Guinea. Uh, it's an investigation that I've done over two years uh, about the development of the tuna industry in Papua New Guinea and it's an attempt of deconstructing the development process to understand why poverty and why sometimes in many developing countries you actually have very big projects, development projects and the word development is a very tricky word in many ways because it's attached to, in many, uh, a lot of times it's attached to progress and what you can see in PNG, but also in many developing countries today, is around very big projects, the fact that you see an increase in poverty rather than an increase in uh, a better life, a better access to services, better education for people. And that's what I wanted to do. I took the case of you know, the development of the tuna industry in Papua mm. New Guinea and then just went out there and documented how local people perceive what's going on to them and what sort of dynamics as well do you have when more and more we know, um, you can see that on TV every day, that uh, there's the, the massive exploitation of natural resources around the planet. Uh, I'll ask you in a moment yeah. what got you into this, why yeah. this story, but yeah. we have the trailer for the film, so just so you know what we're sure. talking about. Uh, let's just run the trailer, have a look at that. Just north of Australia lays the land of the unexpected. Papua New Guinea, a country largely ignored by Western media. The beauty of the natural environment and the friendliness of the local people make you feel very privileged to be here. It doesn't take long before you feel pretty much in paradise. For these populations, fishing, hunting and gardening have been the foundation of life for thousands of years. Se estima que la producción de atún se elevará finalmente a 400.000 toneladas al año, dirigidas al mercado europeo que consume actualmente un total de unas 710.000. Your right to freedom of speech is presently suspended by the Supreme Court reference. The government, the World Bank and all other agencies, they are trying as much as possible to get land from the people. You're developing a whole town, a satellite town. The place where we used to rely on to make atoms and now being occupied. You would like to go home and come back? Yes! You would like to go home and come back? Yes! This is one of the fastest success story promoted by international institutions. A 
A story of cities transforming into processing hubs. A story of people in search of a better life. This block project that you planting also meant by staff or centers or no, yeah? That you might benefit by looking money? No way! Tomorrow this floor is all set finish. Arm the backup and go! Our people uh, expect us to deliver some real developments. No, Marine Park. Resource no timber. Huh? Resource no timber. Mining come out. It's hard to live because it will destroy everything. Our reef, our fishing ground. We will also face the dilemma of having development at any cost. At any cost. The Splai Island before. The Splai Island has become a paradise. Okay, so that was the trailer for the film. We all have a bit of an idea. So what got you into this? Why this subject? Well, I was uh, I arrived in Australia in 2006 and uh, I studied journalism. And in my last year, uh, I was in a class in investigative journalism and I had an extraordinary teacher called, um, his name is Wendy Bacon. And she transmitted really all the passion for social justice as well as for research. And uh, at the end, that was, I was about to finish and graduate. And at that time, you know, you had all these talks about the fact that it was no work in journalism and no future, especially for foreigners like me mm. that have migrated to Australia. And so I thought, OK, um, I'm going to try to apply for a job who uh, is going to be very difficult for me to be able to find something. And uh, at the same time, you know, you learn a lot at universities about all the theories and I had really an urge for practice and to go out on the field. And she showed me in class, I mean, she, with a lot of other people, um, she showed a small YouTube clip about Papua New Guinea where there was a local man, a local landowner, who was evoking um, all the problems that emerged when there was a first tuna cannery, a Filipino tuna cannery that arrived next to his land. And from there, after watching the video clip, I had my teacher who came to me and said, oh, you know, I've seen the small videos that you've done at university. Why don't you, you know, take your camera and go up there and maybe there's a story up there. And next thing I knew, I was researching these big stories and then decided to take my camera and then forget about all the internships that I could have made. That I just learned by myself and it was the most extraordinary experience. Were you intending to make a feature film? No. No, no <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to make, but I think for me it was a a process where I could also test test myself and see if I actually liked the whole process of making a film. If you liked waking up at six o'clock in the morning every day and going to bed at you know <laughs> one a.m. doing your research and then doing that over you know several weeks, and next thing I knew, I loved it. And I think that's where any documentary filmmaker is really the, you need to have passion for what you you do. For so the this topic. is just you and a camera for the most part, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Basically, I was traveling the first time. Was by myself. I was welcomed by many extraordinary local people that were very helpful. Uh, local universities as well that invited me, and I could really um, understand a lot about the culture, about the language, about the traditions, and be really immersed into the into the country. And then I was my backpack. I just went from one village to another village to another village, and then trying to make sense of the big mess that I talk about in the film. So, how long were you there for putting all this together? Uh, the first time I was there for about six weeks, I would say, and uh, the second time I was there for another six weeks, six, if I remember well. Yeah, All right. six um, let, let me get a bit technical on you. What camera did you use? I borrowed a small Sony HVR A1 because I wanted a very small camera, like it's still shooting on HDV uh, tapes, but um, at the same time I wanted some... Was that actually... Yeah. Accidental or did you mean to, I'm going to shoot on tape because I don't know where I'm going to get power sometimes. No. For, ah, that's, that's a tricky, <laughs> that, that's true because when you go into very remote communities as well, you don't have access to, <laughs> to power. So yeah. that's something that you need to consider as well if you want to shoot films. Um, but no, it was just because that friend had that camera mm -hmm. and then for me, any camera would, would do because you, that was the, the best camera, camera because it was tool, free. No, but a, a camera is just a tool as well, and you know you can 
pick up any cameras even now people you know shoot with their phones but yeah. if you really know your phone and if you get to love your phone and love all the apps that you can that you can use you can you can probably shoot very decent stuff as well and and I was fine with my little camera now I would love maybe something better did you do anything did you have a separate microphone and recorder for sound uh no from uh, I had a rogue Microphone. So there's a road on the top of the yeah, camera. Yeah, on top of the camera that was just recording, and I also had some lapels mics that right. you could like to have proper sound, and because that that was very helpful, especially when you are by yourself. The first time I was by myself, the second time I brought a small crew with me, just friends from universities that I had worked with on uh, in, uh, doing some other stories. And but when you are by yourself, that's very helpful to just be able to mic up someone. Then you look at the lights, you set up your shot, and then hope for the best. Like, <laughs> yeah. So you've got. Um, did you have any language problems with the people there? Um, did you have to go through interpreters, things like that? It's very strange because I actually never asked myself that problem, and I know that it sounds crazy because PNG is the, the most diverse place in the world in terms of languages. You have 850 language languages uh, in the country, but um, no, like you, you develop very strong relationship with local people, and you are always going to find people that are willing to help. And, and it uh, seems a lot of people were prepared to help you for this yeah, story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes a long time, but then once people understand what you're here for and what, that you're really trying in your own small way with a film, trying to, to raise awareness about incredible situations out there, then people open up. And so is there any, any in yeah. danger from the tuna companies or anyone you know trying to no, stop you tell the story? Not, no, I never... Or for the I, people yeah, there, was there any danger for them? you need to be careful. You, know, you just need to be careful, to, like, as everywhere, you know, like if you would, you know, start shooting, you know, a show on Saturday night at 10pm in a very hot <laughs> suburb and you just take your camera and go around and then hope for the best, it's not going to work. And I think it's exactly the same in Papua New Guinea. You have a lot of, um, a lot of bad publicity about crime, about all this, but at the same time, people live there and they have yeah good lives and so once you build that trust you'll be fine and but you need to be careful yeah that's the, so that's you, you were there for yeah. two blocks of six weeks roughly yeah yeah to yeah. film it yeah. um how long did the post process take getting it getting it together yeah um just the writing took about nine months <laughs> because it is a very very complex stories and there were lots of it's strange to say but maybe too much material and uh not in terms of footage but in terms of um research and because it is that complex and you're also in a cultural environment that is very complex as well to to talk about outside of png and i wanted to to also make a film for people in the pacific but also for people in western nations because uh it's somehow related to our own ways of development and uh, a lot of the, the, the problems that emerge on the ground have their roots in our nations mm. and but building that bridge is a nightmare <laughs> and but it's but it's great and so it what was the nine months yeah. uh, nine months post basically no nine mm -hmm. months just to write to write and it. then at the same time I had done a first edit um, of about 65, maybe 70 minutes. And then I had a friend of mine in Paris who came on board, thank God, <laughs> because he is a professional editor and it just uh, looked at my stuff and said, okay, you know, that would be great that if we can, you know, work together and then edit this film and then... Uh, and it's now about 90 minutes, yeah? It's 90 minutes yeah. now. And uh, yeah, and that was extraordinary. And that took maybe six weeks to get it, seven right. weeks, but it was complicated because I obviously live in Australia and he's in Paris and then you have to rush and... You know, so how did you work, you know, uh, communicate? What I'm, software were you using and were you I'm Skyping each Pro other? Seven, um, and we were just basically, yeah, using we transfer a lot like so you export you know uh small sequences and then uh i review the sequence and i say oh you need to change this and this and this and this mm. and then but it works because uh because i have a very good relationship with my friend like we grew up together and i think that's that's very important as well for so you just uh, email or, or share file yeah yeah email you, uh, you can use Viber, sequence too. you can use like right. skype and yeah. then, like have conversations and then look at the footage and then it's almost as if you're in the room except it takes a little bit more you know longer but it's it's an interesting way. So at the end of the day, yeah. I mean, what's your call to action from this? And what do you hope people who watch it will do or respond? How, will they, how do you want people to respond to this? Well, I mean, the way they want. But like, what I made it, uh, the reason why I made it is because there, are, there were lots of academics that look at these issues and they look at poverty. And today you have 
between 800 and maybe 800 million to 1 billion people that go to bed hungry. And you've got a lot of people that produce academic articles or articles that go and get published in a small in a journal. But I think it's very different to see the effects that some mm. policies have on people and to just read about it. And that's what really drove me to say, oh, okay, I'm going to, maybe it would be good to use the film medium to maybe try to reach out to more people to at least get people talking. Well, fortunately, least, people are yeah. seeing it. It's got yeah. into a few film festivals, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, do you remember a good run? Like, I'm, um, you know, the first surprise. But. Which festivals have, have has it shown in? Uh, it was shown at the Pacific International Documentary Film Festival in Tahiti. We got the first special jury prize. That Yay. was last month. That was great. Great. <laughs> and uh, it was as well. I was nominated for an F4 Factual Awards at the Australian International Documentary um, Conference in Adelaide last month. And that was great as well. And I could meet everyone from the industry, learn as well, because I've been pretty much on my own mm. doing this, this film, but you need to also learn from people that are much more experienced as well. And So what's uh, been the process? How did you get it into the festivals? Well, that's, that's interesting. So you have a film that you put you know, all your heart and soul into trying to have a product, but then you don't necessarily realize because you don't have the experience that distributing a film is just as much work mm as uh, the post-production and the writing and then the shooting. And that's something that I discovered because you might have a film, you might have shot you know, some good stories or bad stories, you don't know yet because the public hasn't seen it. But um, it's, uh, I didn't know what to do. I'm like, oh, okay, so I've got this film, what am I supposed to do? So I started to enter it into festivals and I thought, okay, if it does well and can get selected uh, into a few places, maybe it's going to get some interest from people within the industry, they can say, oh, we can broadcast it. And that's what happened, basically following the prize at the Pacific International Documentary Film Festival. It was broadca broadcast in France uh, two weeks ago, which is good. Great. And there are more broadcasts that are going to be announced soon as well. You so, can't talk about that yet? Uh, no, no. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but it's good. But there's an Australian broadcaster possibly going to show it? Uh, in Australia, it's currently being shown on Fairfax Media, the Fairfax Digital. Uh, from the On their website? On their website, right. because I needed to release it very quickly and I couldn't wait for the big boys that probably, you know, it's a long film as well and the industry right now doesn't like long feature film unless it's a big production, like yeah. this, this film is made with almost no money. But, um, and, uh, and I didn't really fit the format of like 52 minutes, which was have been good. Mm. And uh, now I'm thinking maybe there's something to do with this. Have you considered um, doing a 52 minute version of it? Yeah, yeah, I wrote the version. It's, uh, it hasn't been edited yet. Okay. Uh, but in case there, there are some interests, like for example, next, uh, next uh, in three weeks, it's going to be shown at Docville in Belgium. And in case there's some really good interest there. So how do you find out about these festivals? It's a hell of a work. <laughs> you just basically go online and there are now thousands and thousands of festivals. And and I can, I can tell you how. I want to see how you did it, though. Yeah, well, <laughs> I just basically, you know, created an Excel file with all the dates, date of submission, the, the, the team of the festival, like, because you can't apply to all the festivals because otherwise you're going to be out of pocket very quickly. Yes. And, uh, but you need to try to select a few festivals that where you think it could be useful. So for, in my case, it would be environmental festivals, even though preaching the convinced is not always what you want to do. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, that's where I started, just Googling and then trying to find um, festivals. You also have some Did platforms. you go through without a box at all? Yeah, it is without a box, but without a box is mainly American festivals and it costs a lot of money. Well, and yeah. yeah, when you start uh, going back through it, I, I did submit to a few festivals and without a box and now I regret it because I think I, really? okay. could I found... Uh, Most festivals if, are on there, but there are ones that aren't, yeah, yes, the smaller like ones. Yeah, but it's like the very, yeah, the very big American, like if you want to get to Sundance, for example, if you want to get to, I don't know, all these American festivals. And, but there are so many other festivals that are not on without a box and you can find them online. And, right. But that takes, yeah, like weeks and weeks. So and the weeks. ones that you have gone into, they specialize in mostly documentary, that's what they're about? Or? Yeah, that's what I thought, because when you apply to just a general film festival, it's going to be more difficult, obviously, to get in, because you have fewer slots. And um, uh, for documentary, I had no experience as well of the festivals themselves. So I'm discovering as well as it goes, you know, I attend a few festivals, I'm like, oh God, that festival is fantastic. Like with my next film, I'm 
definitely you know submit so you've been so, going to the festivals attending yeah, them i try to attend to as screening. much as possible i think it's very important even the, even you know for let's say I, that i wouldn't have been that lucky with this film which has now been shown in a dozen film festivals i think it's crucial to travel as much as you can because that you never know you might meet someone that is interested in it tell you oh you know what are you doing next or well that's the question what I, do you have planned next well, I have <laughs> plans now i'm writing uh new films like shorter documentaries as well and as well as a big feature film too about the pacific but i don't want to say too much still documentary though still documentaries oh yeah, yeah, yeah. investigative what I want to do. like stuff. no i'm hooked on the, yeah you're, you, you, you're yeah. the french michael moore of australia oh god <laughs> <laughs> that might take a while but <laughs> um we actually did have uh uh, a, a section of the film lined yeah. up yeah. Uh, yeah which you wanted to talk about a little bit just run that clip if you could yeah because there was a which there's a particular moment here that you wanted to refer to. Yeah. Um, can we run that little bit there? Thank you very much. So what, what is this? This is uh, about halfway through the film? Or well, yeah, yeah, this is about yeah, half an hour into the film and we get into a place called uh, Seg Island, which is uh, an island where more than 1,000 people have lived there for um, generations. And they are living right next to the biggest, in the, one of the biggest industrial projects in the Pacific, which is the Pacific Marine Industrial Zone. And what you find here for me is really the core of the story because you have people that have been living here for generations and who at the same time are seeing all these companies coming in and are, see, and are seeing the destruction and the end of the traditional culture and as well as the impoverishment of, of their societies. Now you have this woman, for example, who says that she can afford to pay school fees for uh, her kids because all the... Um, all the environment has been destroyed with all these boats that are coming in and out in order to unload all their catches into the port, which is right in front of where these people live. Mm. And uh, with all sort of runoffs directly into the sea. Now, when you have people that have been living for thousands of years out of subsistence farming, and we are still able to uh, be just above poverty. I mean, in monetary terms, they would be qualified as poor but they can still feed their family. And when you have a big project that comes in like that and who takes away the, what allows them to feed their family, I think that's devastating. Yeah. And what you have also is something that is not mentioned in the film, um, is the fact that now a lot of kids used to cross to go to those, the, the only school um, in Papua New Guinea, which, uh, in, that, in, in that place, which is on shore, which is, uh, you can see it here on shore, on the other side, that's where the school is. So in, the best place... Schaffen. And you have all those students that, because they have seized all the land where these people used to harvest their gardens and food, they cannot build traditional canoes. Next thing you know, you have kids that need to be selected because they don't have the boats to just be able to go and go to school. But that is largely mm. unreported. And, and this is happening all over Papua New Guinea, wherever they've got yeah, this. Yeah, it's happening, happening. a lot. Like, that's, that's a paradox, really. You have all these big development projects that it is in fisheries, logging, mining companies as well are coming in big time. And it's, it's a huge paradox where you see conflict around every single project. You have a huge amount of conflict and you have the impoverishment of parts of the population as well. Why is that? That's what I'm fascinated by. Because then if you don't resolve that conflict, you have a situation that you don't want when you see... And it's always the face of the children yeah, that yeah, tells yeah, the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, yeah, yeah. Come back to us now, thanks guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, where can people see yeah. this film? You've got online at Fairfax, yeah? Uh, at Fairfax right now, yeah. And I'm now trying to get broad other broadcast deals because it's being shown now in the Pacific Islands and in France on uh, France O, which is part of uh, France Television. And it will be shown on other, other broadcast with other broadcasters very soon but i can't announce canning yeah. paradise have a look for it on fairfax website or maybe it'll turn up on abc or sbs at some point um and keep an eye out for olivier Pollet and what else he's up to uh, let us know what your next project is when you can talk about it we'll yep. get you back cool. in yeah. thanks very much olivier thank you thank you <laughs> my pleasure. um we're going to wrap up today with a pick my brain question pick my brain and we have a video question from someone. So let's run that. Hey, I'm Claire. Um, I was just wondering which is the best way to learn by actually going to a film school or actually going to film sets? Which is the best way to learn? Going to a film school or working on film sets? What do you think, John? Um, well, I have to say uh, going to a film school, of course, <laughs> shouldn't I? Um, 
Look, it, it depends on what skill you want to learn and you get different things. Um, working on a set, you're going to very quickly learn who's the boss and how not to say the wrong thing. And you might get a lot more of that than actual learning the art and the craft. Um, at least going to a film school would prepare you for the tools you will need to survive on a set and with a crew. I think, um, I think you kind of need both. It used to be that uh, the only way to get a hold of a camera and to actually make a short film if you weren't somehow able to work on a set was to go to a film school. And many of the uh, generation from the 70s and 80s had to do that because it was all on film. It was expensive to do. Nowadays, as you say, Olivia, you can grab an iPhone and go out and film something in very good quality yourself. There's nothing to stop anyone out there grabbing a camera and going and making a film the way you did. Yeah. You know, uh, you don't need a film school to do it, and you've proven this. Yeah. So, but I, I would argue that a film school like ours here at CIFA, it can speed up the process of making the mistakes and not doing that when you're on a serious Phil, I film. I want to pick you up on something, though. You say you know, anybody can take a camera and go out and shoot stuff of wonderful quality. Yeah, you, with an iPhone, you can go out and shoot stuff that is fabulous quality and might still be visually crap. Yeah, but do you know how to actually make a movie mm. is the difference. That's what you'll hopefully learn at a film school like ours, where you'll learn how to do it properly, how to do it efficiently, learn how the industry works, learn the protocols. And if you can get onto a set, you will learn... You can still learn very effectively how things work and you don't learn... The best way to learn any of this is by out there doing it. Mm. And I'm sure you had a lot of lessons for your first film getting yeah, out I there think, and doing I it. I think really what, what you do is you learn from your mistakes. Yeah. And that's something that I really hurts that I had to just go out there and when I look back at it, it's really the, the most mm. enjoyable part. I mean, it's Do you wish you had that. a bit more training before you started? Oh. But you are never re totally ready when you go and you can prepare yourself the best you can mm -hmm. and you can have all that theory, you know, from film school, I mean, and practice as well. But um, there's nothing better that can prepare you than just going out in the film and see if you enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, you, you might have this idea, I'm going to become a big, you know, documentary filmmaker. But if you don't see it for yourself and be by yourself on the ground, you don't know. For me, the, uh, and I agree, yeah. for me, the best reason to go to a film school is two reasons. Not because they've got the gear, but because they've got skilled teachers yep. who know what they're talking about and you can learn from that wisdom and that experience. Mm. And two, you'll meet other like-minded people that you can network with that's and hopefully potentially do something with once you've graduated. That's essential, I think, the relationship that you can build. I see it. I still work with a lot of people that I've met at universities and that's uh, invaluable, no problem, even more valuable than everything that I was Yeah, doing. and this you know, school, for example, yeah. we're very hands-on. We, Our students are always out there making short films, making product, making shows like this. Uh, and that's where we're going to finish it up. Thank you very much, yeah. Olivier, for joining us. Thank you. John, as always, thank you so much. Everyone, thank you for watching. You can catch us on a girlandagun.tv once our website is up and running, or you can email us at a girl and a gun for Twittering. And if you have a pick my brain question or we got anything wrong, do let us know. Uh, but for now, that's a wrap. Yeah, so are you looking at it now and there are things you change? Oh, yeah, fuck. <laughs> I would change the entire film. <laughs> yeah. No, not the entire film, but, uh, but you learn with experience. You know, yep. that's, uh, right, you know. that's, that's and I've, I've done two yeah. features myself and lots of shorts. Yeah. And you say, done with that, move on, I'll do better next time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>